Welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Joel Collins. I'm Hannah. Hi, I'm Fabs. Uh, uh, we are the co-presidents of Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective. We are curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them in the Q&A box, which is down there, not in the chat, and we will read them out for you. One, bear with, bear with us if there are any technical difficulties, and two, let us know in the chat if there are any problems with hearing or seeing us. Um, and enjoy the Q&A. So our guest doesn't really need an introduction, but just to inform you, Joel is a celebrated production designer on feature films, television dramas and commercials. He has collaborated closely with Charlie Brooker on Black Mirror and won a BAFTA award for special visual and graphic effects for his work. Most recently, Joel is both an executive producer and production designer on His Dark Materials. We are really honoured to have Joel speak. So our first question for you is, how do you define your role? Is it as a production designer or more as a visual storyteller? And what do you do? <laughs> um, well, um, I am, uh, I, think, I think I see uh, design as, as a way to tell stories uh, with pictures than rather than words, but it's also closely linked that um, when you read a book, your you kind of your mind fills in uh, from the description and the word. Your mind fills in a huge amount of, of blanks and creates a huge amount of um, kind of visual information. And when you uh, write a script, you are duty bound to. Um, tell the story in you know with exposition and, and words and you you know the script script uh, t tv scripts film scripts they're not designed really to be full of chewy visual descriptive stuff they're they're there to focus on the character development focus on the story development and um and so i work in tandem with the writer to uh to put every character and what they say in a an environment that uh, either makes sense for the place that, and the moment and the thing they're doing or the story or could sometimes speak. I mean, I veer towards weird stuff. So quite often it, it speaks if the actor doesn't um, or the environment or the world building or the setting um, says something um, to you if the actor goes quiet or looks in the distance. And it's kind of a complicated puzzle that you only notice how bad it is when it's done badly uh, and luckily no matter how simple television is or, or films or how hard they are um, most professionals in the industry are very good and so you don't really spot bad stuff unless you unless you know it's, it's I think it's quite rare weirdly to spot, spot bad craft um, it hopefully doesn't often make it to tv so you're not that aware of, of, of the, the stuff that's gone on behind the scenes uh, and if you ask, bad news. <laughs> when did you know that you wanted to to work in design or or in in film and TV? Um, I, I was an art, I was an artist. Uh, well, I wanted to be an artist, and I studied fine art. And before I got offered, I did I did loads of illustrations, loads of character, just kind of character work, and and um, and in about the mid eighties someone took my little book of sketches and showed somebody else who showed somebody else and they offered me a job on a film called who framed Roger Rabbit. And I was about 16 and I said, I, I didn't want to go and work in film. That was crazy. I wanted to be an artist. I don't know what they were talking about. And so I just uh, did, I sounded stupid to me. It sounded silly. So I just went, forget it. And I went and did fine art. And, um, and then when I graduated, um, I started thinking that uh that there's probably a, a way i need to make money there's there's things that you do to make money and fine art isn't one of them um and uh so i looked back at when i was 16 and someone offered me a job and i was like okay that's interesting so i went and looked at and looked around in the film industry at what kind of what what uh, opportunities there were and dug in and ended up working at henson's basically the muppet people sculpting and uh, designing and uh, making uh, things like Kermit and Miss Piggy and creatures for films. My first one was Babe, 
and then a never ending story film and things like that. So I kind of worked my way in an abstract way back into where I could have been many years later. And, um, and it's slowly, yeah. Anyway, ended up in music videos and into film and then back into TV drama from like film all over the place. It's very cool. You've worked for, with iconic characters from the beginning. I think because of that, I um, I did music videos, so I did a load of music videos. I fell in when I left film. I was doing a movie, Lost in Space, and someone offered me a job designing on a video, and I was like, I'm out, I'm out of here. And they were like, What do you mean you're quitting? And I was like, I'm out of here. I'm going to go and make music videos. And they were like, But you're making like a Hollywood blockbuster. What are you talking about? And I'm like, I'm done. And I went and did these videos, uh, like Blur and Pulp and. Fat Boy Slim, like right here, right now, you know, the Amoeba. It was all done, made puppets, and it was all done with, um, creep, you know, creatures and puppets and gloves and, and animation and stuff like that we did in how We tried, you know, all these different, quite crap things to make these music videos. And, um, and it was really, really appealing. And um, the, I think back then it's kind of, it definitely, I fell into a channel where I ended up doing things like the Meerkat commercials. So I've done all the Alexander the Meerkat when we started that and the Knitted Monkey for PG Tips, <laughs> you know, the, um, jo Johnny Vegas and the monkey. And, um, and so I kind of fell into a niche of doing weird stuff and I was often the one, I loved it. So I was the person who was kind of happy to take it on, you know. Um, next question. Um, is there any aspect of film, sorry, got tickle, that you would like to experiment with? Um, <coughs> I think um, that the medium of television is really exciting. And, I, and I've gone on different journeys in different places from films to music videos to commercials, back to films and then into television. And I think um, the opportunities now are broader in television than they've been ever before because VFX is simpler to do. Uh, still very, very complicated, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's an utter minefield and it's really quite difficult to get good VFX. But it's, it's more attainable in some senses to tell stories with VFX and television. It, was, it wasn't really even on the cards, you know, unless you were, well, it just wasn't really possible. It was, it was always going to end up a bit crap. And so I'm, I quite, I love the, the stream I'm in of trying to tell the stories that couldn't otherwise be told in a movie um, with the kind of time you tell, that you have to tell that story as a TV show. So I, I did Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I love making that movie, but I loved the TV show in the 80s. It was really shit, but I loved it. And I probably loved it because I went on a long journey watching the show. And although when I made the Disney version of that as a film, I still love the TV show because it, it filled a kind of hole by giving so much, you know, you could watch it for hours. And, and, and the, a film doesn't give you that. So what's really exciting is making TV shows um, where you would have watched something for two hours, you can now watch it for five, eight hours or more and more, you know, and really enjoy some, a story that otherwise had to get kind of abbreviated and cut up and shortened, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Are there any like special effects that you get to use more? Do you ever think, oh, I would have put that in a film, but we don't have time, but because we're doing a TV show, I can really go into certain aspects of that? I think, um, I think that the nature of production is such that you are very um it's it's quite procedural in the sense that you know you go from script to tone meetings to the you know the script development and the visual development in tandem with the script so really i mean there are things that you can't do but you there it's a slow it's a relatively slow journey it's not often a quick thing where you're like damn you know quite often you have months and months six months or a year to keep pushing an idea even if it's never going to happen um, or, or you just know you're going to give up pretty quick on something you really want to do because it's it's out of the remit, the scale, the financial scale, the time. Um, but, it, but as I say, it's quite a procedural process in the sense of creating that story, the script, the the the, the kind of visual development, you know, the casting, obviously, and, and the production aspects all the way through to post production. And I think the more you understand that that timeline and how complicated it is the more willing you are sometimes, 
not always sometimes to give up on stuff you really want to do I don't like doing that <laughs> um are there any features which draw you to a project in in particular do you look at projects and go oh that one I really want to do because of certain like goals that you think you could fit within it I think I'm loving drama. I used, always used to be drawn from the visual aspect. And I, I'm, I'm loving the, uh, this, the, uh, the older I get, I suppose, I'm 50 and, and that's, you know, it's very young. Um, but and I've, and I think that I've taken, it's almost 30 years I've done this and I, and I, and I, and I feel very late to the party in the sense of loving the story. Um, it's only in the last five, six years that I, I worked out enough of the craft to be able to move on to basically go, now I can really focus on the craft and the story together and enjoy them, you know, and maybe, maybe have an influence over, over that occasionally. And um, uh, so I'm drawn now into stories that are, um, that, that are fantastical, but actually as, as I get older, I'm drawn more into human stories, weirdly. Uh, and obviously I have forged a niche of telling human stories uh, in unusual places. And I hate to say it, but I would get really bored. I love watching TV shows like normal people. I love watching shows that are kind of brilliantly written, brilliantly acted. But I also uh, could think to myself, I could never make them um, because uh, they don't involve some talking creature or other world. I'll, just, I'll leave them to my enjoyment of watching. Um, why did you decide to establish your own design studio? Was it because you wanted the freedom to develop and go down your own path and choose your own projects? So um, that, that painting practice, which we started just after Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was about 2005, I think. And, um, and it was uh, really... Uh, uh, unusual and Disney were very trusting and they basically let uh, myself and my now business partner who was an assistant of mine at the time uh, run the VFX department on, on uh, for about a year on Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and that was a big deal and, and we did all the previs and all the working out of all the shots and all that stuff and it was unheard of it was really unusual and they were like wow this is amazing and, and they did a deal with a big post house where we have responsibility to deliver the VFX kind of information to them to make it more affordable. And, and what we were doing at the time was linking the live action and the VFX stuff in, in the story to make it quite cohesive so that you, you could choose where you went from green screen or, you know, VFX element or a miniature to a set piece. And obviously I thought, well, if I'm in full control and did it with my, my, my business partner, if we were in full control of that, um, then uh, we are um, able to choose, not be told, where you can do certain things, you know, where you can go to a new world or where you can go to a set. And, um, and at the end of that, Disney were very generous and they basically said, just keep, we bought, at the time, of big computers and loads of stuff. And they just said, Joel, have it all, you know, you're amazing, just keep it all. And I was like, oh, okay. So I basically, we used that, basic stuff to start the company obviously within a year it was all just like albatrosses around our necks in the sense of huge machines that slowly got thinner and thinner and smaller and faster uh, but what it did is it kind of it took the experience of that big film and the uh, the ability to have just enough kit to have a few people working uh, to be able to start the company and, and the idea was we were at the time the, the strap line was bridging the gap between uh, VFX and the art department, which is the live action and the and the digital storytelling side of it. Very impressive. Very lucky. Um, painting practice works in concept design and visual effects and previs and, and all of that. Do you enjoy the variety of roles that your company provides? Um, and are you involved in every aspect? Well, there's two partners, uh, Dan May and myself, who own the company. And I'm um, quite a busy uh, independent, as it were. So although I'm, I am involved in most decisions of the company, I'm also involved in huge decisions outside of the company and often have to step away from the company so that it doesn't become a conflict uh, when it works independently of itself, of me, as, you said, as it were. Or even if it's working on a project I'm doing and I need to be careful not to 
be conflicted by the company demands versus my demands of it or of any company. Um, but uh, but there's only it's a it's a very small boutique company, all focused purely on creative uh, storytelling, visual storytelling, pre vis post vis virtual kind of you know augmentation of all different. Like, we're always looking for the next thing. We're always waiting for that wave to go like that, and for us to just pop over to what is the next layer of of um, of processes and filmmaking. So it's, um, yeah, and it, it's kind of good. I think my business partner used to say, you know, you want to be one of those people who doesn't wait for the phone to ring, but you always got enough to, uh, to do. So you're never sitting there going, right, well, actually I'm, you know, I'm a freelancer, I'm employed or any of that stuff. Um, and luckily that's never happened. Um, we're just always busy, but, but I think it was a, it was a way of, adding kind of an ability to do more than anyone else that did what we did, you know, have the scope to deliver on a bigger scope. And I don't think there's any other company like it. I, I know that when someone from Star Wars came, when they were setting up the TV show, he said that the only other company they'd seen like ours was ILM in America. Um, and it was purely because it's really, really creative, a little creative hub, um, not just a big, lump, cumbersome business that, that is all about the cash. It was just, we're all about the creative. Was part of your reason for coming up with Plan V, the, the app that Painting Practice has launched, was was that to try and be ahead of the curve and, and add another sort of skill set to your company? Yeah, um, I mean, that's Dan, Dan's kind of uh, dream child, as it were. We've been working on various uh, kind of body suits, motion capture, and people are always way ahead of us. And um, I think one of the things that we, we, we tried also to do is to take the myth out of VFX a little bit where we could, uh, make it more attainable, um, make it more affordable. You know, all of the early Black Mirrors we did ourselves, we did them without the need of any big companies. Um, we tried new things out. And, uh, and so this is taking a very sophisticated tool that's on the kind of cusp of doing some amazing things, working with the Unreal Engine um, and I think Dan's eager that the basic kind of layout of Plan V, uh, which is Plan Virtual, ultimately, it's like virtual design and planning tool, so you can go and tell, it, tell your film, uh, you can use it like a cameraman in a set that doesn't exist, or a director. Um, and, and I think the, he's, he's eager that there's a freeware aspect to it, and it's not all about money, but it's about you know, getting more filmmakers out there to le learning how to use this tool and enjoying it and getting with the latest technology and, you know, kind of moving, moving up. I think partly as well, like that young, young people are all over it. And then the more kind of mature directors who have been around are like, don't want to touch it. And we were also eager to be able to give them something on a phone or an iPad and say, there you go. Um, Charlie Brooker, I know, is, is love, loves his gaming and tech. And when we when we did San Junipero, we did a virtual um, San Junipero. So we put goggles on Charlie and said, "All right, there's there's the there it is. There's uh, there's Tucker's bar. Go and have a wander around." And he was like, "Holy, holy shit! Oh my god!" Like literally walking around in the virtual Tucker's bar. And we used it um, on on that uh, on, on, all the way back then. Um, just as a way to say that this is it, this is this is this is the space that we're building down in the studio. Um, but actually, it's another hundred thousand pounds to build that piece of the set. Can we cut it out? Do we ever need to tell a story that involves? Can we avoid going down there in the script? Can we just do it here? And um, and they were like, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're so preoccupied by looking around. They're like, yeah, whatever, whatever. But it was a, it was a it was a very clever way of of managing spend and showing people. No surprises. It's not like a sketch or a digital design or anything like that. You actually put somebody in the space and say, there you go, that's going to be it. That's the playground. It'll be there in a few months' time or whatever. Um, but, you know, but that, that huge red line, that if you look over to your right, there's a massive red line through the space. Oh, yeah, that won't be there because we can't afford it. Oh, okay, you know. Um, and and it's, we, we're using it in a very base way, but actually it's, it's very effective. Um, 
And so we've pushed it further and further forward. It's very interesting. You just mentioned working with Charlie Brooker. We were wondering what it was like to collaborate with him on Black Mirror. Well, Charlie's insane, uh, a genius, very, uh, um, very creative and very clever writer. And obviously there was a lot of writers, but he's like the, the lead writer. Um, and I started with them about a year before we ever made a Black Mirror, uh, working on the stories with them. And um, uh, we kind of, there's a similarity in the sense of uh, character in some sense, but he's, and he's really sharp and really funny, uh, but also um, kind of, sorry, my dog. <laughs> um, uh, and and, and, and uh, there's a kind of darkness. And actually, weirdly, for somebody who likes uh, puppets and uh, silly creatures and fun things, there's, I love darkness. I love going into the darkness to find and tell the story. And so there was a kind of kindred spirit in the sense of looking for that. I mean, the Black Museum, my final, after of 19 Black Mirrors, the final one was shot anyway. Uh, I like brought from home all the Black Mirror stuff I have and all the, the stuff I'd collected and put it in the museum. And, uh, and it was hilarious. And everyone was like, oh my God, it's like the mind of an utter lunatic. And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, it's only when I stuck it all together in the Black Museum did I realise how dark it truly was. Um, but Charlie, uh, we, we went through a few iterations of ideas. Some we made later on in season, some with Netflix, right off the bat. The ones we were going to make um, in 2011, uh, some of them just didn't come off. And, and we made them much later or versions of them anyway um but it was it's it's yeah i don't know what to say it's kind of really interesting it was comedy it was done with channel 4 comedy it wasn't seen as very serious by anybody uh we were kind of left alone and, and everyone thought it wasn't really going to go anywhere um so i think we all loved it and thought it was the best thing ever and, everyone, and lots of people just were indifferent so we just kind of cracked on um, and obviously it's, and then I kind of, and I thought when the first one came out, I thought everyone's going to love this. And then, um, and then I was like, hang on. And on Twitter or online, people were like going mental, but generally the audience was like, what's this weird? It's not comedy. Um, and, uh, so it was a slow burn, but I'm really pleased that it, it kind of got the attention in the end as we, as we worked through the seasons and worked hard to tell the stories that it, people started watching the back catalogue of stuff rather than just straight off the bat with the Netflix ones, you know. Mm -hmm. You spoke briefly about sort of the freedom to create your own things. Um, what was it like designing things that don't exist yet? Um, and did you have to set firm boundaries? How did you ensure that it stayed believable? Um, so I, I kind of have a, have a simple motto in, in, in design and visual form, which is, um, you know, just because you, you can doesn't mean you should. And, and what that means is like when you've got that open brief and the worst briefs are like, can you design a spaceship? And you're like, oh God, like there's a billion spaceships, you know, can you design a robot? Like, oh yeah, here we go again. And, and they're hard, they're hard because you can reference millions of them and to be original but good is hard because if you're so original, it will look so weird and everyone will think that's wacky and, and won't like it. Everyone wants to identify with something. So I kind of stuck to a simple rule, which is not to veer too far away from what the real world would offer. And I think right off the bat, Charlie said, picture a world kind of thing where we're five years in the future and it's really interesting. And I said, no, 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 it's like completely not going to be interesting in five years. And the phone might be a bit smaller. And he's like, <laughs> I was like, literally in five years time, our mobile phones are either going to be a bit smaller or a bit bigger. But I don't think that the world will have changed. And, and I think the, if you watch science fiction shows sometimes and someone says 2040 and there's huge skyscrapers and all that stuff, I, and I'm like, uh, you know, I'm not convinced that the world uh, that is going to knock down all our buildings and just rebuild them in 20 years' time. Uh, I am convinced that we'll go into smaller things and we'll just focus into the smaller details and maybe some of the bigger things fall by the wayside and become less important. And, and, uh, and so it was you know, it started where we set, we started setting the tone for that mirror by not playing too big a hand in the things we did. Um, unless we needed to, like 15 million merits, which is set inside an iPhone, obviously Black Mirror being, um, you know, that is what Black Mirror is. 
um, which is uh, your phone, and and uh, 15 million merits um, uh, was a kind of you know launch out into where the show could go for the first season because it was so weird and wacky. But you know, even then, slightly believable and oddly plausible. And a lot of a lot of what we did the first season, which is like Prime Minister and the Pig and the um you know the the kind of telling of you know the 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 15 million merits and then uh, entire history of you uh and i, and it, I mean they, a lot of it kind of bits incrementally bits from 2011 started coming true in lots of weird ways so as we move forward lots of little things i mean 15 million merits entire history of you if you watch that show i had a simple premise which was it was 2050 and I wanted a bit of a 1950s slant. So, and I, I wanted to go to Sweden and they said, we can't afford it. So I was like, okay, um, I'll make it look a bit like Sweden then. Um, which is what I did and made it look a bit international, I suppose. And, um, and I thought, well, cars could be kind of crap, old style, a bit cool, but they'd know if you're drunk, you know, the car would say, please do not drive, you're drunk, you know, so it would stop you driving. So your car could be, a modification of a classic, but in itself would be much brighter than the cars we have today. So everything was very, very simple. And then I designed certain things like apps, uh, like the Willow Grain. Um, the, the the app was a rings of a tree. Now, huge amounts of apps have used that since, but none, nothing was like it at the time. And it, and I used it like the uh, your life is like the rings of a tree. You scroll around your entire life to find things. Um, but ultimately, in really simple terms, I put metal, stone, uh, you know, really earthy things all over the place. And everything was called quite earthy things. And it was just a way of grounding it and not making it all glossy and plasticky and futuristic, but going completely the other, the other way. And I think in that sense, it stayed slightly timeless. And so people watching it in 2020 don't think it was made in 2011 of the future of 2020 type thing. Uh, but it just felt a bit like timeless, like everyone would want to go back to earth. Why wouldn't they, you know? Uh, so we tried to make those basic decisions, which which kept a slightly timeless uh, take on the future where we went there. Um, so you've kindly shared with us um, some graphics or visuals from the USS Callister episode, which I loved. Um, I think we're going to get that up on screen now, but a quick question. How do you approach the task of designing a huge variety of sets and gadgets with, for each Black Mirror episode, which has its own unique sort of um, tone to each episode? Um, uh, well, I, because I'm slightly, uh, uh, I get really bored really quickly. I think what was really useful is to have multiple episodes overlapping. So I'm going through the crisis of what's on the screen in the Callister, uh, the complexity of making a captain's chair, talking to the legal department about not being sued by Star Trek. <laughs> um, trying to make sure that we build just enough set to be able to shoot all the scenes in and, you know, knowing that it's going to be one of the most expensive sets to date on the Black Mirror because remember that in Black Mirror, everything we did was a single episode bit of work. So it would get thrown away quite quickly. Unlike say Star Trek or another show where they use their assets for season after season. Often uh, we'd use everything we did once and it would get, you know, binned. And so this is an example of trying to, uh, I mean, I had a lot of the team who do Star Wars, who are friends of mine, and they came off to work on this with me to give that kind of layer of authenticity to what's actually quite a comedic uh, episode um, and to not make it feel like a bit of crappy British sci-fi TV, but give it a kind of uh, plausible bit of, of consideration in design. And we had to go from what we called the 70s Star Trek, these are just designs, there's a lot of height measure. Uh, we had to go from the 70s Star Trek to something that was more what we call J.J. Abrams Star Trek, but without making it like Star Trek so that we didn't get sued by Star Trek in simple <laughs> terms. We had to like, it had to be an identifiable, an identifiable um, world that the audience could enjoy the slightly exaggerated characters um, but in this instance, you know, there's very little time to tell those characters' stories. So you, you had to use little ploys to, um, to to let the audience know where they are, settle them into the type of genre they're sitting in, and then you take them on a 
roller coaster, you know. That's really interesting. Um, what research did you do for the design of the series? Did you, well, you spoke about how Star Trek and Star Wars had um, like resonances in, in Black Mirror, but um, did you ever look at sci-fi films like Blade Runner or like 2001 Space Odyssey and things like that? Um, no, I think, uh, I think those things are kind of like ingrained in your, um, ingrained in your psyche, especially at my age, you know, you've watched those films, you know, those films. I'm not, um, I think, I think the artist in me likes to believe that I'll find something original or set, set the next path or find that new thing and not go there unless I have to. So for instance, like not getting sued by Star Trek was important, <laughs> but, and, but also not copying Star Trek, but making the audience think they're in a star, kind of Star trek thing. So the whole thing's like a more, that's, that's almost like being a psychologist in the sense of how you're gonna get an audience to settle in something very little time and not copy something, but copy something in, in some sense. It's copy a genre, as it were. Mm -hmm. Um, but generally, um, I'm, I'm a kind of, um, I, I think knowledge is really important, like film knowledge, storytelling, story, uh, uh, you know, the understanding of story and character development is really important. And so learning is really important, but, but um, kind of stealing is, is, to me, is unimportant. I mean, I, I think, as I say, the artist in me makes, what makes me want to find the new trend, find the new thing, uh, do something original. And I found actually in Black Mirror, we started like having to trope ourselves. That's what the audience would have want, wanted or people want. We went, oh, like, can we do another one of those? And I'm like, oh, I mean, I think I, I left after, as, as I say, 19 films. Um, and there's now been 22 or something made, 23, 22. And basically I left uh, at a point where I was going to do something else that was equally as complicated, but, and I loved it. It was like really hard to leave. But at the same time, it was, it's an interesting place because it starts to copy itself. You know, you've done, after 19 of those kind of unusual, trying to be original films, you, you know, this, you, start, you start finding it hard to not copy yourself, let alone other, other um, shows, you know. You spoke about how the kind of like app design that you came up with was later actually mimicked in real life apps. Have you had any weird experiences with Black Mirror fans or futurists who people think that you can tell the future? Um, I, did a, I, did a, I did a talk at the Royal College of Art where I thought it was going to be film students or graphic students or design students. And then I got into this talk where it was, um, and I realised that... Uh, it was futurists. It was an entire full room of futurists. And I was like, so I kind of quietly asked what, what they, you know, I mean, I, I kind of said, well, what is it? What, they, what are they, what are they interested in? And they really just wanted to ask me what was coming next. Um, and I was like, ah, oh, okay. Like I'm a fortune teller. And I think the, the, the question they, most of them had was um, how come uh, I got so many things right you know between charlie and i we, we managed to get lots of things right in the story and the look and the, in the way things were going and the designs of elements uh the predictions were very close and part of it is just being sensible and considering flavor taste you know being, being because you get if you actually wanted to go in another vein you also get things right you could get the naff version of stuff right because there's so many different things out there so um you i think uh the one thing that I, I, I've started to understand and believe is that maybe part of our future is going to be more related to 3D printing. So there is a version where you 3D print, you know, and I've been working a bit with, which is where Metalhead came in, I think, with uh, Boston Dynamics or the kind of robotics of the, mo of the moment. Um, but, you know, the idea of a 3D printing um, station in a wall fixing humans as well as robots um, or, or building houses. And so that idea suddenly of that idea that I fought against 10 years ago of tall houses that uh, were the future. Um, I suddenly realized, well, actually, you know, houses could be a bit like Lego in the future. You could buy modular houses that are huge 3d printed uh, rooms and created spaces and they kind of stick together and then they can withstand. Um, they can be, you know, eco-plastics and they can withstand the weather 
and uh, and um, you know shaking and all that stuff. And so I started kind of scaring myself that maybe I'd dug deep enough to find that things were going to be a bit weird in the future. And uh, yeah, they might be, I guess. <laughs> Um, so maybe moving on to His Dark Materials now, um, how did you come to be involved in His Dark Materials? It's such an exciting project. Well, I, was, I heard they were making it um, and I discussed it with Garth Jennings, uh, who I did Hitchhikers with, the movie version of it, many years ago. And I think we got very excited the idea of that and then it, it, we were like, I think it was so close to Hitchhikers and it just dissolved. And so I was like, okay, this is interesting because the movie didn't quite hit the mark. And, and part of that is it's a very, very complicated story to tell. And we're just on the edge of being able to do things like demons correctly on television, um, where I think a few years ago, you would have really struggled. Um, and, and, you know, we struggled, but, but I think what you don't want to do is put things like a talking animal next to a human and everyone would think they're fake and lose interest in the story. So we, there was, it was like, um, very complicated to think about how we'd do it, but I was very excited by that complication. It's the kind of stuff that I'm like, it's like a magnet. The writing is amazing. Um, Jane Tranter, who owns Bad Wolf, is, you know, an extraordinary, huge visionary in television. And so I kind of partnered up with Dan McCulloch, Jane Tranter, who are the two execs from the show. And we've been very close together now for three years. Uh, making the show and the subsequent seasons and developing the the, the, the ongoing stuff. Um, but it was, I think it was just that kind of like steroidal challenge where Black Mirror is just about attainable. It's one hour, very complicated, but, you know, but, but actually really doable. I was like, that is completely undoable. This is mental. I'm all over it. And I, can't, I, I think I contacted them and said, I think, I really want to do this and um, can we meet? And they're like, yeah, cool. And then it became apparent, you know, I realized then that I'd also have to give up, a, give up my love and the baby, which is Black Mirror, the thing that I basically helped create and, and adored, you know, so that was, it was tough. It was tough, but, it, but exciting because this show is Dark Materials is, is a phenomenal bit of literature and an undoable bit of TV, which we've been doing, you know, so it's exciting. You spoke about it being a phenomenal bit of literature. How did you work with Jack Thorne, the writer, to visually script? You talk about visually scripting to visually create um, his dark materials. Well, Jack is uh, an amazing writer and an amazing storyteller and is uh, busy because he's so brilliant. And we were very lucky to have a lot of his time in, in season one. Um, I think he... I think he, he, he signed a kind of, he always, he would say things like, I'm not showrunner, I'm a, I'm a writer, I love writing, but you know, showrunners are kind of weird uh, animals. They, they are, um, it's questionable. It's like an American term for a very dynamic writer who's on set, you know, hey, you know, like kind of all over all the, everything. And, and, you know, Charlie didn't really do that. He would, um, I would do the visual stuff and a lot of the kind of all over everything and he would do the writing and then he'd sit in the edit um uh, but he, he it was kind of the with jack it was a similar thing i think he was so so relieved that there was someone who was um quite demonstrative and wanted to push that story further visually and uh and he wasn't going to be sat there being asked so what does that look like uh we'd sit together and we'd answer the two questions in tandem and uh, or how does that feel or what's that character who is that blah 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 and I think um, the the process is really interesting I mean we did a we did an interview together and he laughed because he knows that we'd argue we'd disagree um, and or I would do something that I didn't you know the words were wrong uh, or I thought they would be wrong a bit wrong not you know rarely and uh, and I would do something completely different to the basics and him and I would kind of get back together and re he would retool the story to what I'd done or I'd retool what I was doing to the story. It's been a very, it was very, it has been a very collaborative process. Um, but again, there's two, you know, the two execs, Jane and Dan are both into that storytelling too. So it's, um, 
there's kind of like a hive mind of show running on the on the show where we have a group of passionate creatives who want to make that show brilliant and so it's a lot as simple as one person um kind of telling everyone how it's going to be but it's it's like a yeah it's a, it's a kind of group of a vision group as it were it's, it's it's brilliant and it's um complicated but it, and it, but it's exciting how did you guys decide upon that vision for his dark materials don't want to say golden compass but to how did you decide that you wanted to differentiate it from and make your own whole new world um well i think like I say, the kind of character development uh, and what Jack could do was the first part of telling it, the story differently. You know, you, you can... And, and also times have changed. You know, we had to tell a story that, that was a different... that needed to be slightly different to when it was written, in, in some sense. You know, there's a version of us sounding every note of the script and there's a version of us also telling a story that uh, the, the audience of now is going to want to watch. So we were constantly in this kind of back and forth of of, um, of do we copy what's in the book or do we slightly tweak bits to also flow with an audience, even down to simple things like the alethiometer, you know, it's round. And I was like, I'm going to make it square. And they're like, I'm so stupid. I'm like, no, I'm going to make it square. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, not because I'm an idiot, I want to make it square, but I wanted to, having designed so many phones, so many devices on Black Mirror, uh, the last thing I wanted to do was make something that looked like uh, it was Phileas Fogg's watch, you know. And um, and at the same time, uh, it needed to have that that authenticity of its time and look like it would be made by a Czech watchmaker who, you know, like a device maker who'd had his hands cut off after making whatever. I don't know the craziness. <laughs> That's actually from a clock in uh, a clock in Prague. But basically you know, that kind of history to it and the, the feeling to it. Um, so they're, they're kind of subtle little things that we tweaked as well as some, some, some bigger uh, elements, but all of them done with Philip Pullman uh, um, and all of us as a group um, through the story, trying to use the eight hours we had to tell it in the, in the best possible way. You know, it's, it was, yeah. We're into the second book now, so... How did it work being both a production designer and executive producer? Uh, it's unusual, and it's a it's it's an unusual thing. Uh, and I think because I'm I was with this process from the beginning, well, not from the very beginning, but from early on. I went with Jane and Jack to America to meet all broadcasters and to talk about the sale of the show and to um, push, you know, for us to get the best relationships and uh, I've been there with them uh, passionately with the show's kind of like build and um, and I'm there in post-production with them as well through the delivery of the VFX and stuff like that and I think as a designer you're often um, you know people make a piece of set or something and then they do their thing whereas I'm I'm eager to uh, uh, be a filmmaker in this process um, and I think it was the natural progression and a bit like what I did on Black Mirror, I employed a lot of designers. It was a very conflicting thing. I often employed production designers on Black Mirror and they're like, well, you're, and I'm like, don't worry, don't worry about it. Just treat me as the show. I'm going to, you know, you, I need someone to do this job because I'm doing all of them. I'm like, everywhere. I'm doing everything. And they're like, okay, fine. And so after that, I got quite used to, um, you know, to, collaborating in a way that is unusual and, and the term production designer doesn't really um, relate to that level of collaboration so I think it was a natural progression to move to being part of that creative team which Jack is the writer but he's obviously an exec and the two lead execs as well as Philip and you know uh, those those real core creatives on the show basically. Were you on set for production and if so do you have any favourite memories, like seeing Yorick fight for the first time or something like that? Well, Yorick wasn't really there. <laughs> uh, he was just a large, massive bit of polystyrene um, or a puppet or a huge head. Um, 
Oh, I loved the first season was like a bit of a journeyman show in the sense that you, you never went back to the same place. You go from Oxford to London and Mrs. Coulter's apartment was um, really interesting because I wanted everyone, everyone on the set. It's very interesting because all of the crew would go through an emotional uh, kind of state when I, they, because I, I would create these spaces that were quite encompassing and enclosed. So the retiring room, big fire burning in the studio, you know, it feels like a real space, all those Oxford spaces. Uh, that were, were, were set, you know, and there's a real kind of sense of reality once you've got into those spaces. And then Mrs. Cool's apartment, everyone's like, oh, I love this, I love this. And after about a day, they're like, this is weird. This is weird. Who'd live here? You'd be, you'd, you know, you must be evil to live here. And, and, and it was deliberately this cold ice queen palace that was very seductive, you know. It was that thing that you want to go in and you want to go, wow, this is great, I love this. You know, I love the vibe, I love, and slowly it would become insidious, and you wouldn't understand why. But uh, but it was it was um, it was designed for absolutely that. It was designed to be seductive, but un, uninviting in some senses. So just you know, a complete uh, you know, confu- you know, to, com- to leave you conflicted. And weirdly, the crew often were, or people visited and were conflicted. And then we went into the boats and some of the actors loved sleeping on the Martin Egyptian boats, which were sets they were created and they were, had this heart. And as you moved forward, you went to Trollison, which we built an entire town at the Brecon Beacons uh, for Trollison. And Trollison, you know, the crew had the best time ever. It was sunny, it was amazing, and it was a town out in the middle of nowhere that looked like you were in a big Scandinavian kind of um, port town with whale blubber and all that stuff. And, and yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. I loved watching the crew react to these spaces because it's like being an artist again. It's like doing being a kind of, um, a kind of environment artist, you know, where you're basically making something and seeing if everyone, because you don't know what the audience are going to do. You don't know how much they're going to see, what they're going to feel. And you know that that's many, many months, if not years away sometimes. So you're left. So for me, the satisfaction is often with the actors of finding this in involvement in a space or a thing or an item or kind of like uh, this uh, authenticity they find through through being somewhere and or the people that visit or are working there and seeing how they react to a space because I know that it works if everyone forgets it's not real. I mean, the worst things are when people use toilets in fake bathrooms and it's happened a lot and uh you know but the flush doesn't work so that, that goes nowhere but under the floor um so uh but that you know but people forget you know they kind of you just get wrapped up and then think you're in this real world and uh but you're in a bubble that's not real you know yeah that's crazy um what was it like to merge visual effects with your your real life sets i think we have um some slides from his dark materials where you can talk about um merging puppetry with um visual effects and things like that or or the set with vfx uh well we made on our app we made a virtual trollicent so you can see uh here you can see like the cap the, that that's there's the space there's the town we built or in the construction of it um and we made an app virtual version of the town where you could go through it in the studio way before we built it. And we used that to, uh, to calculate how many streets we needed, um, how to tell the story and, and, you know, to walk the story basically of that one episode. Um, and uh, when people got to this town, they would like go upstairs. So that, that this Imerson's hotel, I think we we're on the same thing together. Um, uh, is uh, had an upstairs, had bedrooms, had kitchen, had subrooms, and lots of these buildings had all interiors, things like that. And uh, so you, you know, people would go in and dump their stuff and say, "John, can I?" I'm like, "I'm not the mayor of the town, you know." They'd be, "Can I use this as my, you know?" Uh, so everyone kind of moved in, um, but we used the virtual app to judge just how much we needed from any given point to get. Uh, to, basically, one of the one of the sums we had for season one was if we could build enough to spend enough on VFX, i.e., the more I built, the more we spent in the right area. 
Uh, if I built half a town, we'd be spending VFX money on half a town plus bear and demons and extensions. And it's a hard equation, but you've got to look at the cost of VFX versus the cost of building an entire town. And actually VFX is an extraordinary expensive game to play. And you can build a town to save in the long run. But it just came across like we were a bunch of mental people, really, in the sense of like building a whole town for one episode of a show. Sadly for me, it wasn't, uh, I'm not as bonkers as everyone thinks. And, and because of Black Mirror, where everything I did was for one episode, um, it was completely normal. But all the way along, I was like, kind of, what are you doing? Like, this makes sense. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's kind of standard. Um, so I think soon we'll have some questions from our audience. Um, please type your questions into the Q&A box, which is down there. Um, and while we're waiting, we'll ask our two final questions. Uh, what are your plans for the future? And can you give us any insights into the next series of His Dark Materials? Um, well, I mean, unless you know the book, I don't want to do any spoilers. Um, but obviously, uh, Lyra grows up and... Um, uh, well, doesn't grow up, but, you know, uh, has experienced things in season one where she can um, experience kind of uh, different relationships and um, and has, I guess, it kind of the show matures a bit um, and it has to. And there's enough, there's grief in season one. There's, I don't know, I don't want to give any spoilers away. I don't know what to say. That's a really tough question. Um yeah, just watch it. It's great. Um, but back on what I'm gonna, what I want to do, uh, I'm I'm eager this year um, to uh, learn a little bit more about what you guys do, which is writing. Um, learn a little bit more about those things that I'm I've loved being part of with, say, Jack or with Charlie, which is the the story development. And um, and I, you know, at the age of fifty and as I say, almost 30 years, I think my first job was in 91. Um, I, uh, I'm kind of really excited about learning and I love it. You know, I love the idea that there's so much to learn. And I talk to writers and I talk to um, all types of filmmakers and um, novelists. I, I love, uh, looking at kind of stories and I love um, learning more about them. And I think because I've spent so long learning, you know, as I say, the kind of craft that I do understand, I love the idea that there's so much more to learn. I'm not somebody who sits there and goes, oh, well, I understand this now, so I can just sit back and watch it play out. Um, you know, I, I'm a kind of uh, very eager to to add to that with new new skills, you know. And I think storytelling is, is ever-evolving and really exciting. So it's, it's um, you know, writing is a very exciting place to be and to watch play out, it's, you know, because good stories, being new, not just following trends, but just trying to find new paths is, is really hard, really hard nowadays. So many stories have been told so many times. So, um, yeah, that's kind of... Outside of doing this and lots of other things, I'm loving learning. Fabs, do you want to ask the first question? Okay, um, so would you rather work, this is from an anonymous attendee, um, would you rather work on a project and with a team and a budget that only say, yes, go ahead, or would you prefer them to say, no, reconsider? I think healthy argument is really important and I am an absolute advocate of people speaking their mind and people being heard and people um, having confidence in a group to be able to um, fight for something they believe in and not just being told this is the way it is. Absolutely. Um, I think if you are in any industry, I think if you're an autocrat, if you... If you're not a delegator or a collaborator, you, you, you know, you might do well, but I doubt it. I think, you know, the key thing is that you should fight for what you, well, fight gently because 
find it too hard and people stop listening. But <laughs> you, I think it's brilliant when people put their hand up, no matter who they are, and say, uh, I don't agree. So I'm, I love those relationships. You know, they're, they're the best. Do you have any advice for student filmmakers or production designers who want to follow in your footsteps? Uh, there's so, so many ways now to tell stories. You know, with iPhones and home computers, it's like a completely different world to when I started. Uh, and uh, there were very few routes in, and there's so many routes in. Uh, I would say the only advice, like I said just now, is actually... Think about the things closest to you. Think about the things that you're most passionate about when you want to tell a story or the things you want to do because it's hard. And I talk to a lot of people who give up. And the reason they really give up is because they're not passionate enough. And when you turn to your right or your left and you see someone who's so ultimately dedicated, loves it so much, that if that's not you, you shouldn't do it because it takes every fibre in your being to, uh, to do this work and to keep moving forward and to you know get knocked down and stand back up and and i think if you're unsure you know stick to what you love basically and if it ends up not being filmed so be it um but ultimately uh try and stay true to certain things like try and stay passionate so do stuff that, that kind of excites you and um uh, and for me i was really lucky i'm excited by the smallest and weirdest and stupidest silliest things and, and, and they would keep me moving forward. And other people would be like, why are you doing that? And I'd be like, because in the future, it will all make sense. <laughs> um, and some people need much bigger things to be excited about. Whereas I was, like, I was quite lucky. I, just, I could be excited about little things. Uh, I care about the small details and the big ones. And if the small details are all you've got, I'll care just as much as I do about the big ones. So try and care as much as you can. And it, it will all pay off in the end. Um, do you have any film or TV recommendations to fill lockdown? Oh no, uh, <laughs> I've just been watching everything, but I watch it for work, so I watch everything about, um, yeah, just the obvious really, so that's like, it's a terrifying question, because <laughs> I don't want to say something that was like, ugh, that was terrible! <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I kind of watch most things from Westworld to Killing Eve so I'm like easy and they're all the things that most of you have watched watch the sound materials that's what I'd say <laughs> good point then, uh, um, I think that's actually all we have time for um, thank you Joel for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time and thank you to everyone that joined the call and asked such amazing questions please like our Facebook page for more updates and register for our next Q&A, which is with producer Tracy Seward and Jonathan Price on the 28th of May at 2pm. Thank you very much.